The time has come for me to make a statement. This is distinct from my sermon this morning. It just seems like this is the time and the place. Most of you know me well enough to know that I have thought about this statement for more than a few days or even a few weeks. For months, this has been coming, and for what it's worth, I think it's extremely important in our nation and certainly important in the life of the church. There are four huge issues we are facing in America today. The first is the rise in violence, gratuitous, unnecessary violence. You and I can watch an ISIS video of a beheading or an immolation, a burning up of an ISIS enemy, and we will be repulsed when we see that video. But the truth of the matter is, it, that video arouses the part of our brain that wants more that wants more. The part that cries out for revenge and bloodlust. When I was a child growing up, we had the occasional schoolyard fight. Today we have our, our young people gathering off campus for fight clubs. We see girls fist fighting with one another. We have an increasing exposure to violence, whether it's an ISIS video or something on YouTube, on the internet, whether it's video games, our movies and God knows we all watch it and slowly slowly but surely our sensitivity to violence uh, is being impacted if we're going to be the America that we want to be we must reverse the trend towards violence the second issue is the issue of mental health my younger son graduated from high school in 1999. That was the year of Columbine. I said, congratulations, you survived high school. We don't, know, we don't have to rehearse the list of needless shootings from Columbine all the way up to Newtown and now South Carolina. Our country's mental health response to mental health has been inadequate. And we must do something, and the church must play a role. The third issue is the number of children who are growing up in chaotic homes. Oftentimes, perhaps most of the time, homes where there is no father. Usually in chaotic neighborhoods, surrounded by a culture and an environment of violence and drugs. And with inadequate educational resources and the trend in America the research is unambiguous the trend in America is that we are becoming two Americas an educated America and an uneducated America where people don't graduate from high school where there's more violence more drugs more incarceration less opportunity I could go on and on our government must respond to this, but the church must as well. Programs in our church like Project Hope and Project Next Generation are a start. We must do more. Fourthly, growing racial animus. That word means hatred and resentment. Growing racial animus and resentment in our country. From my perspective, we see it on all sides. But the truth of the matter is that in America, with 300 years of history, slavery, Jim Crow, institutional racism, the burden of the responsibility to address this issue rests with the white majority. And since most of us, not all of us, most of us in this congregation are white and affluent, we have to accept that reality and that responsibility. We'll call it what it is, racism is present in our country and racism is a sin in the eyes of God. Hopefully it is a sin in the eyes of each and every one of us. It's going to take all of us to address that issue, but we cannot turn the other way. Now hopefully you've agreed with everything that I've said up until now. You may not agree with what I'm going to say now because I've already had conversations with some of you. But this is my opinion and I feel strongly about it. 
We cannot address these issues adequately if we don't meet together in the middle. All of America. These are issues that affect every one of us, the quality of life for our children, our grandchildren, and those children yet to be born. And it doesn't make any difference to me at all whether you are a Republican, a Democrat, a conservative, a progressive. It makes no difference. These are the issues that we share together and we cannot address them unless we meet in the middle and do it together. I know that the word compromise has become a bad word. Whether you watch MSNBC and see yourself as a progressive or watch Fox News, see yourself as a conservative, frankly, I don't watch either one anymore because I think that it's TV and radio pundits who have convinced us that compromise is a bad word. Let me say something that I hope will be helpful and it will clarify things. There is a difference between having principles which should not be compromised and having ideas. If I could stand before Congress, and you know this is, not, this is not a political statement in any kind of partisan way. If I could stand before Congress, this is what I would say. Please, as my fifth grade teacher, Mrs. Robertson, would say, put on your thinking caps and figure out the difference between having an idea and having a principle. So if you're conservative or progressive, it doesn't make any difference. If you have an idea about a tax plan... That's an idea. It's not a principle. It may be a great idea, but it's not a principle. It's not a conservative principle. It's not a progressive principle. If you have an idea about how to deal with poverty in America, that's an idea. It's a policy idea. It's not a principle. We need to learn to distinguish in our country the difference between ideas and principles. And so let me just finish by saying to those of us gathered in the church, here are some principles you might consider. Jesus said, love your neighbor as yourself. That's a principle. Jesus said, you have heard it said that you should hate your enemy. I say, love your enemy. That's a principle. Jesus said, consider others to be better than yourself. That's one of our Christian principles. Our principles as Christians drive us into the middle to work together on the issues that are destroying our country okay end of speech <laughs>